digital crowd extras really came to the forefront with the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the software package created specifically for that, Massive. Massive is crazy expensive and crazy complicated. Lucky for you, there are now alternatives, including Miami from the Hong Kong-based company BaseFount. It includes a free version that simulates and renders up to 100 agents. Agents can be humans, zombies, cars, ants, whatever. And as usual, we'll have you up and populating your film set with zombies in uh, a little over 30 minutes. One small catch, Miami is a plug-in for Autodesk's Maya software, so you'll need to rent a license of Maya to use Miami. However, Autodesk also provides fully functional licenses of Maya to students and educators for free, so there's no reason for that to hold you back as you get started. Head over to basefount.com and download and install the latest version of Miami. While you're at the website, be sure to download the Quick Start sample files available on the site. We'll be using some of these files during this survival guide. The installer should automatically identify your installed version or versions of Maya and install to the correct plugin path. In this survival guide, we'll focus on getting you up to speed with a simple locomotion simulation. In a follow-up guide, we'll focus on creating a spectator agent one you could use for populating anything from a kid's baseball match to a giant football stadium. Before we dive in though, let's take a big picture look at how my army works. First off is the idea of an original agent. The original agent is the blueprint or template for creating your massive army of clones. You can have more than one original agent in a scene. You can have one for humans, one for orcs, one for elves, etc. But the original agent never actually shows up in your scene. Miami takes the OA, and from now on we'll just call original agents OAs for short, and uses it to create individual crowd members. Note that the individual members of the crowd are also called agents, they're just not original agents. Original agents are always the blueprints used to create regular agents. So what's an OA made of? Well, it's basically a collection of 3D body parts, a skeleton rig, some preset animations, walk forward, run, wave, or whatever your particular crowd of creatures needs to be able to do, and some surprisingly simple rules used by each agent to decide which animation they should be performing and when. The developers of Miami have done an excellent job of keeping things simple while allowing room to build extremely sophisticated crowd behaviors. Be warned that there are a lot of options, but if you focus on just what we're showing you, you'll quickly build up a comfortable understanding of the workflow. Once you've created an OA, you then add something called a placement node which specifies how and where your agents should appear in the scene. We'll borrow a term from the video game world and refer to that as spawning for the rest of these videos, even though that's not a term used in the official documentation. Finally, once you've placed your agents, you can run the simulation and see what your little virtual actors do. Then you go back, tweak the decision rules and animations until they're behaving or misbehaving exactly the way you need them to. You'll also add a bunch of simple objects like boxes and virtual roads to tell your agents where to go and how to act when they get there. But enough talk, let's get busy. Once you've installed My Army, launch Maya and choose Windows, Settings Preferences, Plugin Manager. Search for My Army and enable both the load and auto load buttons. Now choose File, Save Preferences to commit your plugin preference changes to disk. That way, if you crash, and hey, happens to the best of us, Maya will remember that you want to load the Miami plugin the next time you launch. Start by importing. Choose Miami, Setup Rig, Import Miami Rig. If you get a path error here, just click OK and ignore it. 
This is a test character rig useful for quickly testing things out. Miami doesn't care what kind of rig you use, just as long as you're consistent. In fact, in a later video, we'll use Adobe Mixamo characters with their rigging system. Now, there are a few caveats to how your custom rig is built. Bones in the hierarchy must be directly connected parent to child, and the rig needs to be facing the positive Z direction. But most standard rigs will meet those requirements right off the bat. You'll see that Miami has created a custom tool shelf. Select the Miami shelf and click the Ready button. This is a handy macro button that automatically sets the playback so that it correctly caches at every frame and adds the essential Miami nodes to your scene. Once you click Confirm, you'll see a Miami contents group in the outliner. Shift click it to see all the bits and pieces that the Ready button added to the scene. You'll find a bunch of empty groups that we'll be filling with different nodes as we build our crowd. The first thing we need to do is copy the skeleton and 3D mesh geometry of our character into the Miami contents. Again, right now we're using Miami's provided test rig. In other videos, we'll start with our own character geometry and rig. Find the root bone of the character skeleton. Here, that's root underscore M, and click to select it. Then control click on the Setup Loco Group heading and press P to parent the skeleton under it. You could also use the Maya middle click drag method to parent. The Loco part is short for locomotion. It's the default unique label for your OA that you can rename later. With the rig parented, choose My Army, Original Agents, Create Original Agent. Go ahead and select Fine Tune. You'll almost always want Miami to fine-tune scale and orientation for you before continuing with other steps. You should now find the original agent loco section has been populated with a bone hierarchy that mirrors the original rig we just parented to the setup loco group. With the skeleton copied over, let's get our character's skin. Select all the mesh nodes tucked away in the geometry section of the original character and choose Miami, Original Agents, Send Active Geo to Original Agent. Typically, you don't want to keep the original structure. You'll now see the geometry has been copied into the Geometry Loco section of the Miami contents. And we can actually go ahead and delete the original character. We've copied what we need into the original agent we're building. So here, we'll delete the original character group and then the skeleton rig we parented to the Setup Loco group. Click in the viewer and press 6 to switch the viewer to shaded display if it isn't already set. Notice how the character looks like he's been encased in a Minecraft suit? Well, those boxes are the physics boundaries that are used to calculate collisions when your agents get hit by wrecking balls or drop from great heights. The actual skin geometry of the character would take way too long to calculate collisions with, so Miami uses these simple boxes for the calculations instead. We need to get these boxes as close to the real geometry as we can, so that any collisions that occur look convincing. This is a tedious but important step. To help with this, select the Body Geometry nodes, click the Channel Box Layer Editor, and choose Layers, Create Layer from Selected. Rename it OA Geometry. Now you can quickly toggle the geometry on and off to better see what you're doing. Now there's a generic bounding box around the agent. If you're zoomed out too far, you may find yourself selecting it instead of the joint boxes. And if that happens, either zoom the view tighter or temporarily disable locators via the Viewport Show menu. Select each of the boxes in turn and use the Scale tools in Maya to resize each one to better fit with the part of the body they're designed to represent. It's a good idea to select matching left and right boxes together to save time and keep symmetry. Be careful not to overlap the boxes as you scale them. Typically, you'll only scale a box in two of its three dimensions.
Once the boxes are set up to your satisfaction, you have the option of tweaking the physical joint limits. If you turned off locators in the viewport earlier, re-enable them from the Show menu. Press 4 to switch to the wireframe view and then click one of the Phi Joint nodes in the Outliner. In the Attribute Editor, in the Extra Attributes section of the Shape tab, you can adjust the swing and twist controls to define limits for how far this joint is allowed to rotate or twist. Note, this doesn't affect how the preset animated actions will affect the joints, only how the physics will work when your agent collides with objects or other agents. It's not an essential step when you're getting started, but will help make your characters more realistic, ensuring that they don't bend in ways that, well, humans can't. We'll skip this step for now and cover it in more detail in later videos where we need to work with physical interactions. This is a good time to save your scene. An important note though, to avoid problems later, save as a Maya ASCII file, not a binary. MyArmy's internal macros save as ASCII's and you could end up with an error when MyArmy attempts to save one of its caches if you choose binary instead. Finally, we create a placement node. The placement node is what turns your OA into an actual simulated member of your crowd. Choose My Army, Placement, Create Placement Node. At this point, you'll want to use the channel box instead of the attribute editor so that you can take advantage of Maya's attribute scrubbing. If you've never used this feature before, it's simple. Click the label for the number of agents parameter, then in the viewer, middle click and drag right or left to increase or decrease the values. Remember, in the free version of My Army, you're limited to 100 agents, so don't create more than this or they won't all render out. Adjust the scale parameter to comfortably cover the overall area of the agent. Think of it as your agent's personal space. Here, we've set the scale to 15. Repeat the process to increase the distance between the agents, the number of columns of agents, and then the noise parameter to randomize their position a little. Obviously, if this is an elite fighting unit, you'll want the noise low so everyone is arranged in a tight rank. But if it's a bunch of teen slackers, you want to crank the noise up so there's no apparent rhyme or reason to their position. When you're all done, click the Place Shelf Tool. Now, a quick tip will come in handy when you're trying to art direct your crowd. Let's say all your agents look great, except for that one guy who's getting in the way of the camera. Well, just select that one agent and move him where you want him. Or delete an unwanted agent entirely. Now, drag select through all the agents and choose My Army, Placement, Inverse Place. Inverse place means that My Army is reversing the process. Instead of creating agents from a placement node, it's building a placement node out of the current position of your agents. You'll need to delete the original place node so you don't double up. Go ahead and click the Deplace Shelf tool and all your agents disappear. But you'll see that the place icons on the ground now match the adjusted position you just set up. Click Place again and you'll see that the agents now spawn where you expect them to. You'll be doing a lot of this, by the way, tweaking your place node, placing your agents, testing, then deplacing your agents to make further tweaks. In fact, if you ever make changes and find that things don't seem to look right when you rewind and press play on your simulation, just try deplacing and replacing the agents. Now, there are many more ways to fine tune placement but the inverse place is a handy way to manually clean up placement as you work. With your agents placed, if you click play, you'll sadly see no activity. That's because we haven't told our agents what animations to do and under what circumstances to do them. We'll start by loading in a couple of pre-built actions. Later on, we'll see how to create actions of our own. Open and explore a file browser and navigate to the Quick Start sample files you downloaded from the BaseFount site. In the Scenes Actions folder, 
select Man Action Stand 1, Man Action Walk 1, and Run to Jump, and then drag them into the Maya viewport. Now, Miami doesn't work well with namespaces attached to actions, so choose Windows, General Editor, Namespace Editor. Select the namespaces that appear to the left of the main action names we just imported and click Delete. Then choose Merge with Parent as the deletion method. Select the newly imported actions in the outliner, control click the Action Loco group, and press P to parent them under the Action Loco header. All right. Now that we have some actions to work with, let's create a rule to tell our agents what they should be doing when the director calls action. In Miami speak, rules of behavior or logic are called decisions. Choose Miami, logic and decision, make decision. Since this is the default behavior when the scene starts, we'll call this default. Now, Miami makes building behavior logic as simple as writing a sentence and even provides preset sentences for you to adjust. Most decisions have a condition that needs to be met and an action that will be carried out if that condition is true. But in this case, we want to give something for our agents to do when nothing else is going on. So we can simply click the Make Default Global button. This removes the option to add a condition since the default action happens automatically when the scene starts. Now, we just need to specify what that action is. We want our default action to be walking, so we'll type the name of our action, walk. Notice that you ignore the underscore action underscore man part of the action's name and only type the first part of the action title. Also, actions are case sensitive, so make sure you type the name all lowercase. Close the decision dialog window when you're done you'll see the new decision added to the Decision Loco group. You can always click it if you need to make changes. Now, place your agents and click Play. You'll be pleased to find they now all happily walk forward. Click on one of the agents during playback. You'll see useful information about the state of the agent. First are the hit points and mana points. Hit points are typically used to determine the health of an agent. Mana points are usually used to measure an agent's ability to do a special task. It's important to note, though, that at the end of the day, hit points and mana points are just user-controllable variables. You can use them however you like in your simulations. Then follows a unique ID value. Each agent has a different ID. Then the place node ID we only have one place node, so that value will be zero for all our agents. And following that, the ID in place. That's a unique ID specific to the place node that an agent belongs to. Type refers to the type of agent. We only have one agent type in our simulation, the loco agent, but in elaborate battle sims, you may have several different types. And finally, at the bottom of the information overlay, is the current action being performed and a progress bar indicating the percentage of completion of that action at the current frame. For an action like this walk, the animation will loop when the progress bar reaches 100%. You may notice that the agents all walk in perfect lockstep. Now that's great if they're a crack troop marching to beat, but normal people in a crowd wouldn't all put their left foot to the ground at the same time. Select the Walk action and then click the Action Editor button in the Miami shelf. Change the entry random to 0 to 70 percent. Now each agent will randomly choose a different start time in their walk. Selecting different agents, you'll now see the action progress bars are different for each agent at any given frame. Deplace and replace your agents, then rewind and click Play to review. Okay, so this is a good start, but it's time to make our agents interact with the scene. Let's say our agents reach the edge of a cliff and we want them to stop before they fall off. Let's create a bounding box that covers the area where the edge of the cliff would be. Click the Create Bound Shelf button, 
press R to switch to Maya's scale tool and then click and drag the center of the new bound box to scale it to size. Click W to switch to the Move tool and then drag it into position in the scene. Time to create some logic. As a handy shortcut, click the Make a Decide button in the Miami shelf. We'll call this one Stop at Cliff Edge. Check the box to add an input condition and then right click in the input condition field and choose Bound. I'm inbound square brackets. Using the square brackets option allows us to choose between multiple bounds in the scene. In the outliner, you'll find the newly created bound box under Perception Set. While we're here, double click it and rename it to Cliff Edge. Make sure it's still selected and then in the channel box, note that its bound ID is set to zero. We can set this to anything we want. Let's change it to a value of 1. Now back in the Decision Node Editor, find the two question marks in the I'm in bound input condition we just added and replace them with 1, the ID we just set for our bound. Be careful not to delete either of the square brackets on the sides of the 1. Now check the box to enable our output decision. Right click and choose Action Playback Play Action Priority 1. Replace the question marks with the name of our action, Stand. Looking back at what we've done, we've created a decision node that says, if the agent is in the bound box with ID 1, have the agent play the Stand action, instead of whatever action they were performing by default. To see this play out, you may need to extend the play range out point a little. Rewind to the start and click play again. When the agents enter the bounds of the box, they stop. But what if some of the agents aren't that smart? What if some decide to dive off the edge of the cliff? Well, we can add a second bound box to create that very behavior. Click the Create Bound Shelf button again, resize it, and then position it in part of the first bounding box. We'll give this bound the ID of 2. Double click it in the outliner and rename it to Jump Zone. Click the Make a Decide button. We'll call this one Jump Off Cliff. Choose Bound, I'm in Bound square brackets. And replace the question marks with our new bounds ID of 2. As the output decision, let's choose Action Playback play action, and set the action as run to jump. Rewind to the start of the scene and click play. Now, what you'll end up with is unpredictable behavior. You see, we have two overlapping boxes and the agents don't know which rule they should obey. The one that says to stand if they're in bound one, or the one that says to jump if they're in bound two. We want all the agents entering our new bound box to follow that rule instead of the stand rule. To fix this, we can set a priority for each rule. If we select the Stop at Cliff Edge decision, you'll see that its output decision has a priority of 1. Selecting the Jump Off Cliff decision, we can see that it also has a priority of 1, hence the confusion of the agents. If we raise the priority of the run to jump behavior to 2, it will always beat out the stop at cliff edge decision even though the two bound boxes overlap. Rewind and play back to confirm. By the way, don't worry that they go back to walking at the end of their jump. We'll fix that in a moment. Now, this is all fine, but it's unlikely that all the agents who decide to jump would do it at exactly the same part of the cliff. What if we just want, say, 30% of all agents to jump and the rest to stop? Select the Jump Off Cliff behavior. Let's change the bound to 1 so that we're only using the original bound box we created. We can then delete the Jump Zone node. We won't be using it anymore. Now, we'll add a second condition to our decision rule. Click the checkbox and then right-click and choose Noise ID 
ran float based on my ID from. Since every agent has a unique ID number, this sentence creates a different random number between 0 and 1 based on an agent's ID. We only want 30% of our agents to jump. So we'll set this to 0 to 0 0.3. In other words, the agents whose ID generates a random number between 0 and 0.3 out of a possible range of 0 to 1 will trigger the condition. If we set it from 0 to 0.7, we'd get 70% of all agents, and so on. Note the logic pop-up on the left-hand side. This is common computer logic shorthand. Ampersand ampersand means and. In other words, this condition must be true and the condition above it must be true as well. If either condition isn't met, the output decision won't be triggered. The double pipes means or. So if either this condition or the condition above it are met, the output decision will be triggered. And the final one is XOR. It's short for exclusive OR and means one true or the other, but not both and not none. Now, if that's confusing, think of it like two light switches in your house used to control the same light. They both need to be set to different positions for the light to turn on. That's XOR. In this case, we need both conditions to be true for the jump action to occur, so we'll leave this set to AND, also keeping the output priority of the action at 2. Rewinding and playing back, you should now have roughly 30% of your agents making the decision to jump. OK, right now, when the agents get to the end of their jump, they just go back to walking, which looks weird, and not the kind of thing that happens if you leap off a cliff. We can set things up so that a physical simulation takes over right in the middle of their jump. Create another decision, and let's call it end jump. As the condition, right-click and choose Animation, I'm playing Action, and set the action to Run to Jump. We'll add a second condition and choose Animation, Current Playing Action Phase from 0.5 to 0.7. Now don't panic, this will all make sense in a moment. The first condition is pretty obvious. It will be true if the action Run to Jump is currently being played by an agent. In other words, any of the agents that are walking or standing will completely ignore this rule. But for those agents that are currently jumping, the second condition needs to also be true for this decision node to trigger. An action phase just refers to the action's animation from start to finish and is measured from 0 to 1. So right when the agent begins the jump animation, the action phase is 0. At the very end of the jump, the action phase is 1. So what we're saying with this rule is that when the action phase is 0.5, that's halfway through the jump, but not more than 0.7, or 70% of the way through the animation, trigger the decision output. Now the important bit for us is the 0.5, because we want to trigger dynamics at that moment, halfway through the animation. The 0.7 just guarantees that no agents slip through during the simulation. In other uses of this logic, you may want things to happen only when the animation is between 50 and 70%. That's just not our case here. Finally, what's the output? Choose Dynamics, Enable Dynamics. With that one simple command, we turn our agents into what are called physics ragdolls for the rest of the simulation. Rewind, play back the sim. Halfway through their jump, the agents seem to go into free fall and fall flat on their faces. Now, if like us, this seems to happen in slow motion, that's due to a common issue in simulations the scene scale is off. Click the Miami Physics Global, and you'll see that gravity is set to minus 9.8 meters per second squared, which is correct, except that the rig has a default size of about 40 centimeters. Since an average human is more like 170 centimeters, the gravity simulation here is too small. To correct this, we need a value of around minus 42 here. Rewind and play back, and
you have some awkward flopping. So the next problem facing our jumpers is that they're not really up on a cliff. They're standing on the ground plane. Deplace your agents. Select the cliff edge bound box and control click the MCD place node to select both. In the channel box, move them up in Y to a value of about 200. Place your agents again with the place button. Things do not end well for our jumping agents. Now just to show you how sophisticated you can get with these very simple decision nodes, let's add one more behavior. In the real world, peer pressure means that if someone in the crowd near you decides to jump, you're more likely to trust that they know what's going on and jump as well. Maybe there's a cannonball coming from behind and the person in front knows it's safer to jump into the water below. Well, let's have our agents decide to jump if they see their neighbors jumping. Click the Make a Decide button and call this one Peer Pressure. Right click the input condition and choose Someone in my sphere and his sphere color ID equals. Well, this one needs a little explaining, obviously. Each agent has an invisible bubble around them, their sphere. We can detect things that come into their sphere and act on them. We can also set a color for the sphere. Useful for diagnosing things, but also helpful as a tag. Let's change the color ID to 3. So we're telling each agent, if another agent comes close enough to be inside your sphere and that agent's sphere color has an ID of 3, trigger the output decision. As our output decision, choose Action Playback, Play Action, and enter Run to Jump as the action setting the priority to 3 to make sure this beats out any other action that's going on. Right now this won't do anything, because none of the agents will ever have a sphere color ID of 3, so the input condition will never be met. But, let's switch back to the jump off cliff decision, add a second output decision, and choose sphere, set my sphere color, and set it to 3. Now the jumpers, and only the jumpers, will have a sphere ID of 3, causing nearby agents to jump as well, thanks to our peer pressure rule. Rewind and play back. Wow, well, that's a whole lot of jumping. You can always reduce the size of the sphere range in the original agent parameters to reduce the number of agents caught up in the jumping frenzy. Let's go back for a moment and increase our agent count. If you've customized your place node, like we did by performing an inverse place, you'll need to change the place type back to 3D box. Here, we'll increase the agent count to 99 and readjust the other properties. If you place, rewind, and play back, you'll quickly find the simulation of the physics starts to bog down on your system. Now, that's okay while you're tweaking things, but you'll want to cache the simulation for smooth playback for final decision making and then render. Click the Miami Tools Shelf button to access the cache tools. Don't enable Agent Cache. You'll only enable the cache once you've actually created one. First, we need to tell Miami where to save the cache to disk. We'll open an Explorer window, navigate to the folder we want to use for cache files, copy the path, and paste it into the cache folder field. Now we'll give the cache file a name and click Make Agent Cache. Miami calculates the simulation and then caches the result to file. Now, when we enable the agent cache, you'll see that we can play in real time again since Miami is no longer calculating all the decision and physics logic. It's simply reading the results from the file on disk. If we want to make more changes to our simulation now, like say, disabling our peer pressure decision, we'd need to disable the agent cache, 
perform the make agent cache operation again, and then re-enable the cache in order to see the changes. Of course, with this many agents, the ones that stand at the edge of the cliff are starting to inhabit the same physical space as each other. To fix this, we'd need to create additional decision rules to have them avoid each other when they get too close. We don't have time to cover that in this quick start, so we'll just dial back the agent count and readjust their spacing. In another video, we'll take a look at avoidance behaviors along with more elaborate battle staging techniques. Time to render out our scene. Click the Render Global button in the Miami shelf. Miami supports several popular renderers, including Maya's native Arnold rendering engine. But for simulations with agent counts less than 3,000, you can use what Miami calls its Mesh Drive Render, and then render with Maya's standard batch rendering system regardless of the specific render engine you typically work with. We'll use the same cache folder for the pose cache that we used previously, copying it from the Cache Tools window. We'll give it a name and choose Miami Render Mesh Drive Export Cache. With all the caching done, we can finally set the scene up for render. And here's how. Deplace the agents. And now choose Miami, Render, Mesh Drive, Duplicate Meshes. For our simple setup, we've only used a single mesh for all our agents, so ignore any warnings about randomizing textures or mesh. Finally, choose Miami, Render, Mesh Drive, Enable Mesh Drive. Maya will display the final placed render ready agents as bounding boxes. Assuming you have plenty of video RAM, you can select your placed agents and choose Miami, Render, Mesh Drive, Show Geometries selected. Click in the viewer and press 6 to view in shaded mode if you're not already in that mode. All your agents are ready to render in whatever render engine you choose. Now it's worth taking a moment to talk about realism here. No modern audience is going to believe that our simple test scene here was a real-world crowd scene. That's due to several factors. In our next Miami video on creating a stadium agent, we'll see how to quickly remedy most of these issues. So, plenty of room to grow as you start to build your own crowds, but now you should have a firm understanding of the principal processes behind building a Miami crowd.